They made my life a living hell. I felt I would be controlled all my life. I was made to feel worthless and like a failure. He raped me on his wedding night. To be married off to a stranger was terrifying. I always felt trapped between two cultures. I couldn't even cut my hair. I sacrificed my happiness for my parents' happiness. I was born in Britain. England is my home. I am a British citizen. I was born in Britain. I was born in Britain. This is my home. Torture. It was torture because I was getting raped all the time. I was made to have a child. A forced marriage is very different to an arranged marriage where you have two willing people consenting. A forced marriage is where you have one or both people saying, actually, mum and dad, I don't want this. Mum and dad are not accepting that. And then duress becomes a factor. And then they're pressuring you to go through with it. And that pressure can take various forms, psychological abuse, physical abuse, a number of things. I was 14 years old and they took me to Bangladesh and they got me married to a man who was twice as old as me. We're talking about UK British subjects here, men and women. Predominantly we deal with women who are affected. When I did come back to the UK, I tried, I tried to kill myself and I got taken to hospital. There was a misconception that a forced marriage and non-abuse is part of one's religion, tradition or culture. It clearly is not. Cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. This is child abuse and a public protection issue. I started to bunk off school quite a lot and they, they wouldn't question why I was. The education sector is at the heart of prevention. That's where we need to be. So that means in schools, colleges and universities. There was this threat that if I stepped out of line that I would be taken away because I had heard that this has happened to other girls and taken out of the country, out of the UK, to Pakistan and left there um, until I was ready to be married. On their wedding night, they will be raped. Then they will be forced to stay with that person. That's how I was led to believe my life would, would go if I, if I didn't, if I, if I wore makeup or if I, if I wanted to cut my hair or something like you know, that, or if I didn't listen to my parents. Honour-based violence is now a national term that is adopted by all police forces and we recognise it as a form of abuse against men and women which is rooted in notions of dishonour. So for example, a family may have a system whereby you, growing up in Britain, are not allowed to do certain things that may bring shame and dishonour to the family. My life was under constant control and monitoring. So what time I went to bed, the phone calls I made, friends that I had, books that I read were not in my control but they were in my family's control. I was also always told that because I was blind and a woman I couldn't have high aspirations or be independent. I was told that I would be forced to rely on my family for the rest of my life. I don't talk to my father because he was the main perpetrator and my uncles were so I don't talk to extended family also but um, my mom and my brothers and sisters I still have contact with them. I am in touch with with family members who have accepted um, my my decisions and who are supportive um, of that. I'm still in touch with my family and it was really important for me that I didn't lose my family however there were times when I thought I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to maintain this relationship but I've been very lucky I think I think that it could be very difficult for some survivors because it could be on a spectrum and if I had ever, if I had thought there was a threat I would hope that I would be able to have been able to separate myself from that. Calm Nirvana is a national organisation, a campaigning organisation, but one of the most unique things we deliver is the helpline service. So this is a, almost a lifeline for people who are affected by forced marriages and under abuse. Currently, we're dealing with around 700 calls a month. And these are people who are calling us and saying, I'm being affected by this. My family have seen a message in my mobile phone and now that's enough to get me married off to somebody because it's a cause of shame. 
we're dealing with officers, teachers contacting us because they've got cases. But the point here is we know 700 calls a month is still a drop in the ocean in comparison to what is happening nationally because this is hidden abuse. Now the types of people that come into the police station, whether they come in on foot or we get referrals from external agencies such as health, um, education, even a workplace, it can be anybody, any, any sexual orientation, any gender, any age, and we've had girls as, long, as young as 12 years of age come in, up to women in their 50s and 60s, and most recently I've had a transgender male also come in and speak about his problems at home. So it can be anybody. It's not a stereotypical person that we can say you are a victim of honour-based abuse. It can be anybody that comes in to see us. Education is extremely important and it's where we need to be even more important than dealing with crisis because you're preventing it from actually somebody being affected by a forced marriage. Educating future teachers who are going to be going out there into schools who may be in classrooms where our most effective groups sit. So we've got to make sure they understand what to look for. Then it's ensuring that we're in schools and talking directly to students, the affected groups, but also their mates, because their mates need to know about this so they can tell others, you know what, it's against the law, or there is a helpline number, etc. 